Wow, you really can't see anything up here. Um, my name is Patrick Marsh. I'm a PhD student at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, I also work with the National Severe Storms Laboratory uh, as the liaison to the hazardous weather test bed, and I'll talk more about the hazardous weather test bed in a minute. And uh, I use Python in pretty much everything I do, but unfortunately, for those of you in meteorology, uh, you probably recognize that meteorology is not a land of Python. It is a land of CSH, Fortran, MATLAB, uh, and it becomes really complicated and hard to deal with the large data sets that meteorology is moving to. Uh, so alternatively, this title, this, this talk could be titled Stories of a Python Missionary. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so the hazardous weather test bed is located between the National Weather Service office in, Fort, in uh, Norman, Oklahoma, as well as the National uh, Weather Service's Storm Prediction Center. Uh, and it's basically an area for researchers and operational forecasters to come together to tackle the ongoing problems in meteorology. Uh, every year we hold uh, a, a big experiment, uh, a forecast experiment uh, with the Storm Prediction Center in which we evaluate the next generation of uh, storm scale forecast models uh, that basically, they're basically uh, forecast models that allow for thunderstorms to develop on, in them uh, and uh, things of that nature. Uh, and the catch is when you're dealing on the size of the United States, uh, these four kilometer grids add up and you deal with very large data sets very quickly. Uh, and that's just for a single model, not even dealing with an ensemble. Uh, and typical data flow for the spring forecast experiment kind of looks like this, where we have multiple centers from around the country passing data to uh, the National Sphere Storms Laboratory. Uh, and it's my responsibility to, to accept this data and then farm it back out to different partners that are involved in the spring forecast experiment. Uh, and in general, in about a five-week experiment, we'll generate around eight terabytes worth of data. Uh, and it's, it, it's hundreds of thousands of files. Uh, and uh, that's just the experimental data. That doesn't even include the operational data that currently ex uh, flows on a daily basis. And so, since I'm supposed to handle all the data flow and, and the data processing, uh, it, it basically works like this. My advisor uh, and boss calls me into his office and, and says, I need you to be able to handle NetCDF, GRIB1, GRIB2, GEMPAC, CSV, irregular ASCII type files. And oh, by the way, this needs to be done by sometime next week. And during the experiment, the data comes in any time between midnight and 6 a.m. It has to be ready by 8 a.m. I have one computer to use. It's a 16-node quad proc dual core. And my advisor says that he needs to be able to understand the code and run it himself. And he only really knows Fortran and C shell. And so distributed uh, SSH and creative seashell scripting uh, came to my rescue last year uh, for extremely small values of rescue. And so this year, I had, in addition to all the normal data flow nightmares, I mean issues, uh, we also embarked on doing some convective initiation experiments. Uh, and this involved uh, basically a lot of grid point computations uh, for a 10 member, uh, 10 member ensemble of uh, storm scale models in which the domain was 863 grid points by 693 and we had 433 time steps. Uh, and uh, we were doing some object tracking code as well as some image processing code both of which were written in either, for, uh, the object tracking code was written in Fortran, and the image processing code is written in C++. 
uh, and it was actually part of another meteorological display package and all the unnecessary parts needed to be stripped out. Uh, the results then needed to be ensembled and plots needed to be created. And again, in reality, I had some, anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour to pull this off on any given day. Uh, and so fortunately, this is where Python came to the rescue. But before we even get to the experiment, the Friday before it was supposed to start, a network issue on the, uh, basically erased the continuously backed up home directories. And so everything that I had deployed for the experiment was lost. This network issue also managed to take out the continuous backups. And so 100 hours later, and absolutely no sleep, with the help of Python, I was able to recreate everything that was lost. So essentially, I recreated about two months worth of work in about five days. Uh, and I rewrote some, a lot of the code, this time in Python, under the guise of, I'm sorry, we don't have time to rebuild uh, all this. So for just an example of how Python uh, was, was used, this object tracking code was written by uh, a National Sphere Storms Lab scientist, but it was written in Fortran, but he didn't want to use allocating arrays, or dynamically allocated arrays. And so because the file so the, the number of objects uh, was growing depending on uh, the given day, he kind of guessed at what a maximum number of objects would be and just set the, the upper bound to a really big number. And this resulted in a huge compile time and a, lot, a huge memory footprint. Uh, which basically it meant that I could only run, using the Fortran code, you could only run this code one member at a, uh, one, for one model at a time because the memory footprint was enough to take up over half the available memory on the computer. The rewritten and slash optimized version uh, I did in using Cython and I got approximately the same speed as using it in Fortran, but because of the much smaller memory footprint of the, with the dynamically allocated arrays, uh, I was able to actually run this in parallel uh, and in fact Scott was able to process the entire, on, the entire 10 member ensemble in about 30 minutes which was not possible using the Fortran code as written. Um, with the added benefit of the code was much easier to understand, much easier to maintain uh, and was able to, it's able to be extended for future years and in fact I, I modified I wrote several different versions and extended this code throughout the course of the experiment just because I could. Uh, then to turn it to some plotting, uh, using matplotlib to, to evaluate some of these CI diagnostics, uh, we were able to create these domains over which to evaluate whether or not the numerical models could accurately predict convective initiation. Uh, and this is just an example of the, the web page uh, over that uh, the graphics I was able to produce using matplotlib uh, and base map. In the upper left uh, is, the, the, is the, the orange area is the forecast domain that we used. Uh, and so all of the statistics are limited to this bounding box. Uh, and so with the, with the uh, Thanks to the, the master array capabilities of NumPy, I was able to essentially take this bounding box and then mask out everything else and then multiply that mask against uh, uh, the convective initiation fields and then just do sums. And so it was real trivial uh, to essentially develop these uh, statistics such as computing the number of convective points in the domain uh, and then building a, a essentially a, a CDF plot uh, of the number of uh, convective initiation points. It was, uh, you could easily go in and pull off the, uh, the, f the first convective initiation object out of the various methods that we had uh, and, and that we used. Uh, and then you can actually do uh, a CDF of not the first convective initiation point, but all convective initiation points 
Uh, and then you could create the, the probability dist uh, distribution uh, of when convective initiation would occur throughout the entire ensemble. Uh, and I know to a lot of people in this room, looking at these plots, they're incredibly uh, simple. Uh, and I readily admit that, but in meteorology, this, I mean, this was the, the highlight and talk of the experiment. The ability to, to create this kind of information on the fly uh, very quickly and efficiently and simplistically. Uh, it's not something that you can do with, with Fortran very easily. Uh, and it's not something you can do with uh, Seashell either. And so, uh, at least in, uh, in, our, in our realm, in the, in the convective, in the sphere convective storms realm of meteorology, uh, the value of Python is, is starting to, to be recognized. Uh, and in fact, the next generation of the Weather Service's visualization software, uh, AWIPS2, uh, Advanced Weather Information Processing System, uh, it's being written entirely in Java, and everybody hates that. But the one part that everybody, everybody likes is the fact that it has a Python console built into it. Uh, and NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, are all shipped with this uh, AWIPS console, and then you can have hooks built, and then are hooks built back into the underlying data, so that anybody who knows Python can then come in and write their own little uh, extension or module to interact with uh, the underlying meteorological data that the weather services use on a daily basis. With that in mind, uh, at least for convective storms, uh, one of the, the biggest tools that we use for visualization uh, is known as a SKU-T log P. It's, a, it's basically, it's a, for uh, those uh, in physics, it's essentially a tephagram in which the temperature axis is skewed 45 degrees uh, or any, 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 uh, any number of degrees that you'd like uh, in, the, in a clockwise direction. So instead of having orthogonal axes, you actually have uh, skewed axes. Uh, it's not an easy, easy thing to do. Uh, and, oops, you do. Uh, and because, with the help of uh, Matplotlib, Python, NumPy, or excuse me, not Python, NumPy, SciPy, uh, I embarked on a, on a program last fall. Uh, excuse me, right around Christmas to uh, basically write one of these QT log P viewers uh, in pure Python uh, just to, to see if I could do it. Uh, and so I sat down after Christmas because I was um, needing some alone time after spending five days with family. And uh, uh, Sharpie is, is the result of that. Uh, and the source code is uh, for the current version is, is dumped on uh, the GitHub repo. And uh, this is the first uh, graphics that I was able to create uh, using Sharpie. Uh, and so what we have here is the, the, the red line is the, is the temperature profile and the vertical. Uh, the green line is the, the dew point or moisture content profile on the vertical. And the upper right is, a, is known as a hodograph. Uh, which is the display of winds uh, uh, in the vertical, but as in a two-dimensional sense. So if you were to imagine plotting a wind vector uh, starting from the origin and th all the way up and then smushing it down into two dimensions and connecting the endpoints of those lines or of all those vectors, that's essentially what the hodograph uh, conveys. And so I was able to create this in uh, using Python uh, in the in the in the, the NumPy SciPy tools, uh, with Tikenter. Uh so this is actually uh, in in just in, I think it was a couple days I was able to essentially write all these tr all the transforms that I needed to do these projections uh, in Python and then dump them into the drawing routines of Tikenter just because. Uh, the idea was we never knew what version of Matplotlib was going to ship with AWIPS. And if we wanted this to work for forecasters in, the, in their local offices, we needed 
uh, to ship with something that we knew would be there and we knew what we could count on and so we started with Tekenter. Uh, and so this is a plot uh, of just one sounding. You can then, here's a plot where we have an ensemble of soundings uh, and I should point out that this uh, blue line here is the wet bulb temperature uh, and the, the yellow lines here are the partial trajectory. So if you were to take a parcel of air from the surface and lift it in the vertical, what's the trajectory it would take uh, relative to the, the temperature? Uh, and without going into all the meteorology, the greater the distance between the uh, environmental parcel, uh, which is the red trace, and the, uh, or the environmental trace, which is red, and the, the parcel path, which is the yellow, uh, the, the greater that difference, uh, the more energy there is in the atmosphere, and then this in turn leads to the more energy available for thunderstorms, and so you end up getting severe thunderstorms, or the potential for sh really strong and severe thunderstorms, uh, the, greater, the greater this distance is. And this happens to be a sounding from, uh, it's a model sounding uh, from April 27th, 2011, which is uh, the biggest tornado outbreak uh, in the modern uh, uh, data set. Uh, and out of that, all these thermodynamic quantities that are uh, extremely relevant to the meteorological field, particularly the severe storms field, uh, they're computed as the parcel is, is lifted. And so once the, par once the parcel uh, is plotted, you essentially get all of these, this information for free and then you can dump it right back out. Uh, I know it's probably hard to see, but uh, it computes all these for a surface-based parcel, a mixed, la mixed layer parcel, a forecast parcel, a most unstable parcel, and then the effective inflow layer parcel. Uh, and so uh, having this information readily available to not only forecasters, but also, anybody who would like to download the code and run it uh, is, is, is kind of a first. Uh, I should say that as we move forward, there have been quite a few discussions uh, here at SciPy this week as the, as the best way to move forward with the plotting because uh, trying to take these text parameters and then incorporate them back into the plot uh, became a nightmare to do in Tekenter and it was decided to abandon Tekinter and actually embrace another uh, dr uh, drawing routines. Uh, and so uh, I willingly allowed my arm to be twisted this week and we're actually uh, been having discussions every evening as to how to, to actually incorporate these drawing canvases and move them to matplotlib. And then eventually uh, I'm, uh, Ryan May, a matplotlib developer, uh, has been working with me in the evenings and we've um, trying to introduce the skewed axis uh, transformations so into the matplotlib core so you can actually do uh, skewing of, just, of anything, not necessarily something needed for uh, the skew t hodograph. So uh, stuff that we're doing in the hazardous weather test bed uh, in trying to, con the, the stuff that I've been doing in the hazardous weather test bed and trying to convince my advisors and those who uh, refuse to abandon the Fortran. Uh, the stuff that the, the, I've been using Python, saying, "Hey, you know, we really need to be moving in this direction." There's all these available toolkits. Um, is is we're getting to the point now where it's not just for what we're doing. We hope to be able to start giving back to the community as well. Uh, and I think some of the 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 things that we will learn in, in creating the SKUT class will will go back. In, uh, at least into the matplotlib uh, libraries. Um, so uh, I'm, st I'm still relatively new to the Python and the, the, and the scientific uh, computing and Python community. And so if anybody has uh, suggestions or things that they would uh, think could help us in, in meteorology and particularly uh, that in the hazardous weather test bed, uh, please stop and let me know. Um, I'm eager to learn and the more information I'm given, the hopefully the bigger the community can become as we convert some of the, the diehard Fortran people. So, thanks.